The shadowy figure known as the disciple whom Jesus loved appears in five scenes in the Gospel of John. And in these scenes, the beloved disciple largely stands in contrast to Simon Peter, who is characterized a little less positively than this disciple. In each instance, the beloved disciple responds to Jesus so that the narrator considers his words praiseworthy. And at the same time, Peter expresses confusion and doubt and misunderstanding before denying that he even knows Jesus. In a sense, the beloved disciple gets everything right. Twice he's found in a location that indicates his loyalty to Jesus. He responds appropriately by believing at the empty tomb, even when he does not understand. He also recognizes the risen Jesus from afar, while the other disciples do not. In what is probably the most critical comment about the beloved disciple, the narrator depicts him as leaning back on the chest of Jesus, or leaning back against Jesus, which is an English rendering of the exact Greek phrase used to describe the relationship between Jesus and God, which is often translated as close to the Father's heart in John chapter 1, verse 18. Each of these depictions reinforces the idea that the beloved disciple should be seen as an ideal follower of Jesus, one with whom any faithful reader can and should identify. Describing Jesus' crucifixion, John narrates the following. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. That's John chapter 19, 26 and 27. And these two short verses open up multiple questions and multiple possibilities. On the historical front, scholars are still debating the identity of this otherwise anonymous beloved disciple. Is he another figure from the gospel, such as the apostle John to whom the gospel is attributed? Is he Lazarus, whom Jesus has also loved in John chapter 11, verse 5, along with his sisters Mary and Martha? Is he Mary Magdalene, a view based not only on novels such as the Da Vinci Code, but also grounded in recognition both of Mary Magdalene's fidelity and of the greater likelihood of a male versus a female author gaining an audience? Is he a composite figure representing who any disciple could be or should be? Is his an anonymity to be compared to the anonymity of others in the fourth gospel, including the mother of Jesus who was never named in this gospel? On theological and pastoral fronts, the beloved disciple signals, among other matters, the beginning of a new family gathered in Jesus' name. The responsibility of the younger generation to care for the elders of the community and by extension the role of that next generation in preserving tradition. Once again the question of memory surfaces. So for us what stories do we remember of those at the cross and do we want to remember Jesus as suffering or as in control as engaging with strangers or speaking to those closest to him. The Gospels offer us choices, and the stories don't have to be mutually exclusive. John's beloved disciple appears a few other times, and in each case, his role is both enigmatic and filled with potential. Like the woman who anoints Jesus at the home of Simon in Mark 14, the centurion at the cross, and the two thieves crucified on Jesus' left hand and his right hand, he shows that important roles are often played by unnamed actors. The lack of a name allows us to focus on what the character does or how he is known. In fact, the Gospels themselves came to us originally from unknown authors. This isn't to say that Matthew and John, the apostles, and John Mark, the companion of Peter and Luke, the friend of Paul, were not the actual authors, but anonymity need not diminish the value of the testimony. A 
anonymous authorship places emphasis not on the one presenting the material, but on the material itself. We might wonder if our names were unknown, by what titles or descriptions would we want to be remembered as a parent or a child, a teacher or an artist, an activist or a soldier, as beloved or loving or passionate or compassionate. The beloved disciples' very anonymity prompts us to question our own self-identification as well as how we identify others. And yet, by showing how Jesus takes special notice of the beloved disciple, John also reminds us of all the other anonymous witnesses who have gone unnoticed from antiquity to today by the people who are writing history. If we look through his eyes, we focus differently of all the people who are around us even today on whom do our eyes fall? Who needs to be noticed and acknowledged at this particular moment in our own lives? By mentioning at the cross that this is the disciple whom Jesus loved, the fourth gospel also sends us back to the farewell discourses in chapter 13, where Jesus issues another commandment, a new commandment. It's the same commandment that forms the name of this particular day in Holy Week, Maundy Thursday, with Maundy coming from the Latin words mandatum novum, or new commandment. John 13, verse 34 reads, I give you a new commandment that you love each other. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Now there is nothing new about the command to love one another that has already been established in Leviticus with the commandments regarding the love of neighbor, that's Leviticus chapter 19, and the love of stranger. Nor is John talking about love of enemies. The focus in this discourse is on how the love displayed by his disciples for each other works. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John chapter 13, verse 35. And John is not talking about emotive love. Love here means a practical stance, an action. Taking an older woman into your house and guaranteeing her support for the rest of her life is this new commandment in action. The mother's obedience to the commandment also shows the commandment in action. The beloved disciple and the mother will love each other and they will continue to comfort each other. Part of that comfort is the memory of how Jesus loved them and cared for them. The beloved disciple will do what he can to console the mother of Jesus by becoming a new son to her. For those of you who have lost a child, I imagine that one child can never really replace the child who has died, but that second child can comfort and support. Memories of the dead are not replaced, but they can be supplemented. When the second child reminds the mother or any parent of the first by action or saying or even mannerism, there can be a sense of peace. When Jesus told his disciples to love one another as he had loved them, he did so knowing that he would not be with them forever. Immediately prior to the love command, he informed them, where I am going, you cannot come. That's John chapter 13, verse 33. The beloved disciple, in obedience to Jesus' command, will welcome Jesus' mother, not as a stranger, and not even as the mother of Jesus, but as his own mother. He cannot go where Jesus has gone, but he can live as Jesus would have wanted him to live. And so can we.